welcome to the Comfort Club. I am your host, Jamil Payne. And with me today, as always, is my co-host Amanda Coleman. How are you doing, Amanda? You know, I thought I was doing great, and then I got a little scrambled a few minutes ago. So we'll see how this is going to go. Today we are talking the Squadron Supreme, but we have a special guest today. We have a Harvey Award nominated writer. Is is that correct? Yeah, Harvey Award winning writer. Oh, winning. Okay. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Uh, he... Multiple nominations. Multiple nominations. But, yeah, we actually we actually won. Okay, cool, cool. So that know, my... was was that for an earlier book, David? Uh, yeah, that was for a High Moon. Okay. We Which have... is like ten years ago. <laughs> We have with us today is David Gallagher. He's Gallagher. Gallagher. I, I did. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> How are you doing, David? I'm doing great. Um. So, uh, David, I know you because for a little while we had the same local comic book store, right? Yeah, we had the same local comic shop, and um, you were contributing to. A comic book website. Yeah, those are back in the outhouse days where, um, you know, I I actually, <laughs> uh, you know, got comic books to review and, and put them out there for, I don't know, maybe 10 people in the outhouse forums to read about. But it was a pretty sweet gig. I got to meet a lot of cool people, um, make some good connections. Um that was that feels like it was forever ago too. Um, it was like three years ago. Yeah, we we just recently ran into each other again in Baltimore Comic Con though. How did that show go for you? That was a really really productive show. We were nominated for two Ringo Awards for Unliving Boy, uh, and um, and that was a it was a really fantastic show. A lot of really uh, active and and super happy, uh, super fun. Uh, readers which was really spectacular uh i feel like baltimore i've been to a few other conventions i feel like baltimore is very good for being focused a little bit more on comic books it feels a little bit more like a traditional convention or maybe an older an older style convention um yeah it's one of it's one of my absolute favorites um but when i ran into you there uh i did pick up a copy of the creator own stuff that you're doing right now, right now. Um, the only living boy, only living girl series. Um, so, I mean, I read, I read the whole first part, the, the only living boy, um, and Jamil read a little bit too. So we were hoping that we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the process of getting this published. Um, cause you, okay. this isn't like a, talk about it. Well, because, I mean, this isn't like a, you know, you didn't, like, pitch this to D.C. or something and then get it published there. You had to do a little bit more work on your side, right? You had a little more option? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was kind of a weird challenge. So, uh, it's sort of a weird challenge. So, it was, um, originally, we had done, we had a, had a lot of success doing... Um, High Moon for DC Comics, and then uh, we developed with Comicsology uh, Box Thirteen, which is um, the very first comic ever designed for an iPhone. But there was an op opportunity um, to really sort of um, work with um, work in trying to figure out something new to do. And we had both um, we had both Steve Ellis and I, the artist, had both wanted to do something fun and unique. And I had come up with this idea for sort of this I am legend post-apocalyptic um, post-apocalyptic series. Um, and uh, because I was working for the NYPD at the time and I was on the set of I am legend. So um, which is the Will Smith movie. And I thought, you know, like um, after having left work, I was um, thinking, well, like, Will Smith is like this 40 year old super badass. Uh, of course, vampires are going to be afraid of him. You know, <laughs> but what vampires wouldn't be afraid of is some like 12 year old uh, pale white kid, 
you know, uh, with no memory and no skills. And that became sort of the basis for what this series was about. Um, uh, and um, as I was thinking about it, The Only Living Boy in New York, the song by Paul Simon and Simon and Garfunkel had come on to my iPod. And so I thought it was a good uh, opportunity um, to sort of tell a story about that. And as I brought that idea to Steve, we were in the midst of High Moon and Box 13 and a Marvel project all at the same time. But we had um, we had thought about it and ruminated about it and developed it from this like um, sort of kid versus zombies story to this more post-apocalyptic world setting. Um, and we kept trying to find different platforms and avenues to um, distribute it on and ultimately landed on doing it through Kickstarter. Uh, and so we, we put it through Kickstarter and that was a huge success. I think that that was almost seven years ago at this point. Um, and um you know, we had done the first issue and kickstarted it and was super successful. And then when we went to do the second issue, we didn't get the same. You know, it was all self-published and we didn't get the same traction on the second issue that we were hoping to get. I mean, that we got on the first issue. Yeah. Um, so we decided to release it, the whole series. We had had a lot of success releasing High Moon and Box 13 on the web. So we had moved to moving. Uh, own living boy to the web so we put it on a website we put it on various platforms like tumblr and uh, so this is technically a web comic yeah well technically it's a kickstarter comic that then became a web comic that then became a children's comic okay i just have to tease jamil a little bit because you know sometimes sometimes he insists he doesn't read web comics Uh, uh, i tricked you i tricked you (laughs) Hey, Dave, so I just want to say that, you know, number one, thank you, because I was going to ask you about the Simon and Garfunkel thing, because I was thinking the same thing when I read the title. Also, I think this, like you said, this is a children's book. I immediately right. gave this book to my son. My son is, is 11. And I was like, right. hey, you should read this. Yeah, I love how it was, this definitely feels like a book for... I wouldn't even say children. I would say like preteens specifically, but it's not dumbed down at all. No, I loved it. I, um, yeah, I, I absolutely loved that. Um, is there, is that tone something that you were conscious of when you were putting this together, David? Yeah. So I really wanted to do something that was sort of like a cross between, um, Pulp Fiction, not the movie Pulp Fiction, which is not. <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, um, you know, um, well, I wanted to do something that was a cross between like Flash Gordon and John Carter and The Jungle Book and The Island of Doctor Moreau, and take these these themes from children lit themes from children's mm-hmm. literature, which are serious i mean if you read uh the jungle book or you read the island of dr moreau or you read the burroughs um you know the burroughs books with tarzan um they're all very very powerful and pulpy and dynamic and characters die and and bad things happen uh, but ultimately the themes are are ones of heroism but i also wanted to mix it with you know, themes of children's literature that I grew up with. So stuff like the Black Cauldron series, the Puritan stuff by Lord, Lloyd Alexander and the Bridge to Terabithia series by Catherine Patterson. And then, you know, fun, pulpy stuff like, you know, uh, Thunder the Barbarian and, you know, hmm. like um, that kind of stuff. I really want to pull from those those sorts of materials. Um, so we put together something and debuted it in 2009, right around the same time that Adventure Time and Battling Boy came out, um, which are also about kids in post-apocalyptic worlds. Um, But it was, it was interesting to see that that was sort of preeminent theme, but our series is so much, I, and and not to take uh, anything away from those two books, but those, um, 
those stuff is that stuff is I don't think has the same sort of psychological richness about trauma and emotion and grief that I think our series does. I uh, no, this is yeah, that that's kind of um like I, I was gonna I was gonna like Google search you real quick and a- find out if you had like a background in psychology or something. I do because, have a background in neurology and psychology. Okay, yeah. because I was I was going to say like in it like you know, Jamil said like there, you know, there are kids we know that we want to give this book to already. I also kind of want to give this book to my friend who's like a trauma social worker so that she can share it with her clients. Right. Um, just because it seems in such a natural way to address how horrifying it is to be a child and also have actually, like, it's not, (laughs) it's traumatic enough growing up and then bad things are also going to happen. Um, And I think this book addresses, like, both of those feelings. Yeah, it's... um, um... It's really interesting. We don't give, um, I think, the psychological space for um, children, a range to feel their emotion and create uh, narratives of success that bring them from uh, um, periods of grief. You right. Know? So I think that that's creating, using a book like this as a guidebook for how to overcome trauma, I think is, is important. You know, I think it's important to create the, create this opportunity to give young readers uh, self-talk, you know, to give them, uh, to give them opportunities to find, um, to find things that sort of keep them going through, uh, emotionally troubling and difficult times. Um, so, I, I, you know, it was a it was a lot of fun to bring some of this to the forefront with the series. Um, I had one more sort of big idea from this book that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, I think one of the very, I think one of the strongest parts of this book is the creature design. Mm. And I'm sure that that's something that Steve helped you with. Um, I just, I mean, in it, so all of the monsters look cool. All of the vehicles look cool. All of the buildings are cool. And then each of these monsters has sort of a full culture that I imagine you both had to build up. Um, that just seems like a really exciting process to me um is there like how collaborative was it like how much did steve just help you out there i imagine it was a lot well i i think that i mean steve and i both have backgrounds in um role-playing games and role-playing game design okay so um by and large we looked at cultures from games that we love and we thought well what what makes for a really interesting, rich, fully lived in culture, you know? Um, so is it a sense of music? Is it a sense of art? Is it their literature? Is it what they eat? You know, uh, how is it that they present everything? Is it the architecture of their buildings? So in a visual sense, um, so in a thematic sense, that's the stuff I'm really thinking about in, um, in uh, this is a slight spoiler for Own Living Girl 2. Uh, in Own Living Girl 2, we have a new culture that we're introduced to called the Hierophants, um, which are like elephant people. But it, it, they're also named a Hierophant is also like a golden scholar or magician that you see in like the tarot cards. Right. Mm, like, yeah. The, all, so we can we took elephants and we took these super scholars and we created a race of elephant scholars as one you know, does <laughs> as one does and we thought about what it is that they would look like and and so 
I was like, well, we need what I really need is thematically own living girl is going to address these things, um, you know, about, uh, about knowledge and intelligence and, um, wisdom and, and guidance we're gonna go on to that piece of the puzzle for own living girl uh, but we we need a race that that looks like that and, and mirrors that and steve was like great well i don't want them to look like elephant people so let's build them up and and decide what their market it's going to look like and what is their commerce going to be how how are they going to um, in, in what are they going to trade in? Are they going to trade in money? Are they going to trade in gold? Are they going to trade in silver pieces? Um, you know, so we really, really thought from the, the ground up, how is it, how is this society going to look? And that's a, a lot of fun is, is really thinking about what it is they eat and what it is they, uh, they do for fun and how is it they're, they're cold and what is it that really drives them to, to being, um, you know, super engaged in, in their world. Um, so ultimately, you know, uh, it, it really comes from these, these, these this world building comes from our experiences in, um, in role playing games and, and really thinking about, you know, how you build a really deep, rich society. Um, and I think that, that that's ultimately one of the things that I, I love about working in the book is that none of the races, while there are some similarities in, and in, in how um, they react to fear and how they react to, because a lot of the races in Only Living Boy, for instance, are all in various levels of hiding, whether it's an insect city hidden in the sky, whether it's the groundlings hidden in the ground or the Myrmidonians hidden in the water. They all respond to being in high, or the Alku that are hiding in trees. All these societies hide. They're all hidden societies. Uh, but how they re respond to that, you know, uh, as a response to, to um, tyranny is very interesting. You know, and Eric, uh, our main character, facilitates them coming out of hiding. But, but um, that process is all really interesting because it means different things to each culture. Um, that that all sounds like so much fun. I feel like you're pretty lucky that you get to do this regularly. <laughs> Yeah, and working with Steve Ellis is an absolute dream. You know, he uh, we definitely think think of these things from the ground up. Oh, and what I was going to say about the Hierophants is really like what what was interesting about designing them, and people will get to see them is we really try we really try to use a basis in reality, and then also apply different. So we try to whether it's an insect city or fish people or elephant people or rat people, we all try to give a very logical understanding yeah. ability to like how their body moves in space, how much weight it takes up, how much height the characters take up. Um, the sectarans who we, we see earlier in, in volume three, you know, like some of their armor is designed off of like samurai armor and some of their shells are designed like cockroach shells. And some of them are designed like spiders and, you know, so it's fun to take all these different elements and, and put them in a place that feels good and lived in. Um, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, this is very cool to hear um, how thoughtful and how excited you still are about this book. Um, I'm absolutely looking forward to getting Only Living Girl. Um I, I may not even wait for the omnibus again this time. Uh, I, I may actually show up to one of your events already owning the book. <laughs> um, so, Dave, let me ask you, are there any plans? Have you got any interest or maybe turn this into a TV show or some type of movie? Because it seems like it's ready made for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, we would love to. We previously worked with... Um, some really great people developing it, early, but we didn't get the, the sort of traction we wanted on it, but there's still opportunities, I think, to develop it into fun, unique, and, and really, really exciting. So I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, yeah, that it will become something. Um, I'm hoping that it will become um, really, really something really, really fun um, and anime 
animated and alive and so that it gets a bigger audience, you know, because I think, think that that's what people are doing right now. Or people are really interested in seeing this sort of, con on, you know, stream on streaming channels and stuff like that. And that's something that I think could be an a absolute amount of a lot of fun. You're such a professional. I love how you can be nonchalant about that. You're like, yeah, you know, maybe. <laughs> I would be, I would be completely bonkers excited. I would be like, maybe we were talking about it and I think it would be great. And like, I know all these people and maybe it would happen. And, um, I think it's, <laughs> I just find it, um, you know, I... <laughs> you know, after watching, um, the dark crystal TV series on Netflix, I think, you know... Oh, there's the, definitely appetite for this. Yeah, there's definitely, like, maybe even in live action with, with, with Muppets. I think... Oh, I, my gosh. Yeah, I would love... To, oh, man, that'd be so much fun. <laughs> yeah, these are definitely creatures that would be great. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I would love that. I was just watching... Uh, um, I don't want to spoil it, but I was just watching Mandalorian, the second episode of Mandalorian. Oh, my God, it's so good. Of, Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to say anything else other than just finished watching the second issue, the uh, second episode this morning, and I was like, you know, this could be a really fun lived in space like that. Well, I haven't watched anything on Disney Plus yet because I was busy doing our other homework, <laughs> uh, which was reading the Squadron Supreme. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. And thematically, it, it, it sort of fits into what we're doing with Only Living Boy in that uh, in Only Living Boy, um, our main character gathers a bunch of friends to fight uh, tyranny against an, an orange covered creature. And in a way, Nighthawk <laughs> gathers a bunch of his friends to fight Hyperion, who's an orange costumed creature who is uh, tyrannical with his friends of the squad it all it all works together i guess that goes into our set wait today we are talking the squadron supreme <laughs> <laughs> written by legendary writer mark greenwald with art by john busima bob howell paul neary and paul ryan <laughs> it's, it, it's a it's a 12 issue maxi series that ran from september of 1985 to August of 1986 it's published by Marvel Comics the synopsis goes the Squadron Supreme is here prepare for a different kind of hero when the Squadron begins to rebuild society from the ground up is it better to be loved or feared will the Squadron Utopian program lead to peace or chaos so David why did you want to discuss the Squadron Supreme this is a recommendation from you uh, I love this series. It is my uh, next to New Warriors, which is my all-time favorite comic series of all time. This is probably my favorite comic book series. Um, and, and for Marvel, it's it's a really interesting. It's really interesting for a couple of things. One, for Marvel, it's the closest thing that they have to like a self-contained miniseries event. So, like, with DC, you've got The Killing Joke, you've got Dark Knight Returns, you've got Kingdom yes. Come. And a lot of these timeless, you know, um, that sort of exist um, slightly outside of continuity or, you know, can be read from start to finish. And there's a definitive beginning, middle, and end. With Marvel, that's so infrequently the case. You know, you might have something like the death of Captain Marvel graphic novel, um, but there are very seldom original s stories that have a, a definitive start point and a definitive. And if you're reading this, this book, um, there there is like one crossover issue. You don't really need that much of information to really understand that this is uh, the Squadron Supreme is. Marvel's version of DC's Justice League. Right. Yeah. You know, you know go ahead. No, it's funny what you say about Marvel. I know for this show, me and Amanda have a hard time reading Marvel for this show in particular, for that exact reason. Because when you pick 
up a trade to read there's so there's so much stuff connected to it and you almost feel like you're not getting a whole a whole story even though you're reading the main book so it's 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 definitely something that I've picked up on. And go go ahead. I, I just like you know you, you just made me think of that. Yeah, and so uh, what you really need to really need to understand are these are the archetypal characters. Uh, their backstories are are changed. Then some of the file numbers, serial numbers are rubbed off. But these characters are analogs to. Uh, uh, Marvel's analog characters to DC's icon superheroes. Hyperion is a sub for Superman. Nighthawk is Batman. And Power Princess is Wonder Woman. Amphibian's Aquaman. Blue equals Hawkman. Lady Lark is Black Canary. Golden Archer is Green Arrow. So it goes down the line, you know. Wait, wait, wait. Um, We're not going to talk about the Wizard. Oh, uh, the Wizard is the Flash. Uh, <laughs> um. Did these characters exist before? Um, I mean, some of these are such direct analogs, it's difficult for me to imagine that these were existing characters beforehand. Yeah, but they existed. They were introduced in the 1960s. Wow. Um, so they, they originally appeared uh, in the 1960s. I want to say, yeah, late 1960s, early 1960s. 1970s so um because they were literally a parody called the squadron sinister um and and that's sort of a very interesting um yeah they they were debuted in uh if i remember correctly october of 1969 you know so originally the squadron sinister was a pastiche of the justice league because who wouldn't you're marvel and you're like you know you're running you're creating your character yeah. Like, well, let's create evil versions of the Justice League for our characters to fight because, you know, who doesn't want Earth's mightiest heroes against, like, the world's greatest superheroes, you know? So, um, well, and, and also making them, um, like, a, a something that's a parody or something that's satire or pastiche also protects you from copyright. Like, if you're if you're just ripping off Superman, you can't do that. If you make Superman evil and then tell a story about what if Superman was evil, now you've done something original. Right. That's right. really clever. Yeah. So in in a way, these characters started off the Squadron Center: Doctor Spectrum, Hyperion, Nighthawk, and Wizard. You know, and they were like the four characters, and eventually. Um, members of the Squadron Sinister became heroes in the mainstream Marvel Universe. Um, Nighthawk joined the Defenders. Um, Wizard became the character known as Speed Demon, uh, who's a member of like the who's a member of like the Sinister Syndicate or whatever it's called. Uh, um, you know, so are uh, the Sinister Foes of Spider-Man or whatever. Um, so all these characters sort of existed there. Um, but then after the Squadron Supreme became sort of super popular. Uh, um, they were brought into the mainstream Marvel Universe and they became heroes, but they always became superheroes that were sort of easily mind control. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and they talk a little bit about it in, in the, um, they talk a little bit about it in the, um, the miniseries where they sort of set up up that they were controlled by various different forces and they were always like um they were always like the superheroes the justice league but they were always sort of uh, um mind controlled to fight the avengers or mind controlled to fight for the grand master um or mind controlled as part of some like serpent crown serpent cartel sort of thing um so uh each time they they show up they're duped which is hysterical. Yeah. Um, the, but, I mean, that, but, that makes um, that makes this book even funnier that mind control is such a, a theme in the opposite direction. Right. So they were constantly duped and duped and duped and duped. Um, but um, what was nice is that in 1985... Uh, Mark Grunewald used the opportunity to take these characters who had appeared in Thor and appeared in Defenders to tell a, a series about them. Um, they, had, they had last appeared in Defenders 114 
And uh, this was an opportunity for Mark Grunewald to tell a story um, with, uh, with I think, Bob Hall and, and the rest of his creative team, John Buscema and Paul Neary and Paul Ryan, um, and Al Williamson and Janice Chang and Christina Steele. Like, all of them came together. And Ralph Macchio, I think, was the, epi- the editor at the time. They all came to tell it, uh, together to tell where the world is destroyed. Um, and uh, the president of the United States is the Batman analog, Kyle Richmond, who is also sort of the superhero Nighthawk. Um, and they all work together to... Um, you know, I just have to interrupt and say that I love the... Um... I love that so many nerds are like, if Batman's got so much money as Bruce Wayne, like, why doesn't he just, you know, like run for mayor and like run, fix Gotham that way? And I love right. that, like, <laughs> this starts out by saying, oh, yeah, all of those like super typical complaints that everyone has about how the Justice League should work in reality. We're just going to like. You know, we're going to use those. Like, we're going to go ahead and say, "Yeah, Batman retired and decided to become president." And and uh, and, and it all yes. went bad. It went even <laughs> yeah. worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and this is why. Yeah, this so, is why Bruce Wayne isn't going to do that. <laughs> right. So that's that's the basic setup. You're absolutely right. Is that the basic setup is now they have all these. This is this is the Justice League literally trying to solve real world problems. That is literally the premise of this book. What if this Justice Society decided, the Justice League decided to end hunger, end gun rights, end death, modify and rehabilitate all the criminals? I mean, this is this is like, what if the Justice League solves real world problems? That is this story. Um, and it, it's, it's a very interesting analysis on uh, on power and how power corrupts and there's so many different, beautiful, well-crafted themes. I mean, and keep in mind, this book came out before Watchmen. It came out right. before Kingdom Come. It came out before Dark Knight Returns. So this is this book, in a, in a lot of ways, is preeminent and uh, preeminent in, in sort of telling a very. I mean, it's filled with Marvel trappings, as you would expect from a 35-year-old comic. But it's also um, but it's what also makes it so interesting and so relevant is that it really discusses a, a lot of important themes that we're still talking about today in 2019. I was I was going to say, I think this book is going to be my new go to example of any time someone goes, oh, but like, I don't want politics in my comic books or like, when did comic books get so political? <laughs> I was going to be like, boom, like. Like, this isn't the start of it, but this is, uh, you know, solid proof that, you know, most of, I mean, I think you're, I think you're a little bit older than me, but, uh, like, Jamil and I couldn't even walk yet, and boom, <laughs> comics and politics. Uh, right. You take know. away Captain, Captain America punching Hitler, or take away Wonder Woman and all her feminist trappings, like, Look at 1985 and before Watchmen and before Kingdom Come. This is an adult, like Watchmen's pretty adult, right? That's an adult series. But when people are like, I don't want politics in my comics. Boom. Pol- take away Captain America, right? Boom. This is a comic book about politics in a way that is really interesting. And the characters, by and large, go from um, each character has their own, like, moment or issue to shine by and large um and we can get into into all the nuances of that but i think that by and large um this is an amazingly compelling a very nuanced story that i i when i was younger didn't expect from marvel and still i look back 35 years and go like holy moly like this is this is it. incredibly yeah. complex storytelling it's so political that there's like at least two meetings every issue. That's how political it is. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of So Hyperion love his meetings, man. Yeah. <laughs> but the Justice League in the seventies and eighties used to have meetings all the time. And um 
So like going from from top to bottom to people who haven't read this book, uh, who haven't read this book. Um, yeah, it's basically the Justice League. They they literally decide to take over. Um, and in the first issue, um, Kyle Richmond, the character Nighthawk, decides to not be with them. So it's every other member. They've decided to unmask. They've made all their super identities public. They have made that they have totally outed themselves as superheroes of the world that no masks, no secret identity and literally just come to the government and say, uh, inspired by their Wonder Woman analog power princess who lived on a utopia. She's like, well, what if we create the world as a utopia? And the, the Squadron Supreme goes to the government and says, give us one year. We'll make the world perfect. Right. And 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 it's really interesting because the governments of the world give them total power. It's not like they you really know? had a choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the governments of the world give them total power. And in the, the first issue, Nighthawk has the opportunity to kill Hyperion because he sort of knows what is going to happen. But he chooses he chooses not to. He's too cowardly. Um and and then literally we watch as as twelve issues unfold and it becomes um, uh, it, it becomes really really it, it's sort of a mess. Characters die. I mean this this book is not is merciless with the <laughs> characters it kills off. And I mean in the no, this is season, this is like Game of Thrones. No, none yeah. of the characters are safe. Right, none of the characters by the 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 by the final issue seven characters alone in that issue died. but i mean this game totally picks off like i, I easily i think 14 characters I, if i if my count is off i, I maybe a little off but at least 14 characters die i think in, in the series from, and some um, of them unceremoniously yeah some of them really unceremoniously um so um because i can remember four and then seven that's 11 i think yeah. Anyway, a lot of characters die or disappear or like wander off. So it becomes uh, it becomes really interesting. What is so we talk about it. I, I want to talk. What were your overall impressions of the miniseries as a whole? You, you go first, Amanda. Um, I so I was completely blown away, like you said, by the the political sociological themes that it addressed and how it was just very matter of fact and nuanced about it, you know, showing arguments on, on both sides and reflecting how real human beings with different backgrounds would react. Um, I, I was not, I'm not always expecting that in my exposition, heavy primary colored, older comic books, um, I was also completely blown away by how you can take these characters that you don't really know and we can layer our understanding of the Justice League on top of them. And suddenly, it, I mean, like, it works It works as a Justice League story, too. Like, I, like I was saying, I, I said, oh, this is what if that, we you know, what if Bruce Wayne took his money and decided to get into politics? And then... We recently read the um, Jeff Jones run of Aquaman, where something that was pretty badass that came up was this idea that Batman's really the most dangerous guy in the Justice League, and you got to get rid of him first. And I was like, this book is sort of entirely about the idea that Batman's the most dangerous guy in the Justice League, and you could have the entire Squadron Supreme, but if you don't have your smart principled you know night themed batman analog on your side you're never going to make it yeah that's true. Um, <laughs> it's so true just sort of this uh underlying idea that it's not like just another way of driving home that it's not the superpowers that matter uh it's kind of like the principles and the morality um I mean, ultimately, that's what Hyperion comes to understand is that he could enforce a, a benevolent dictatorship as long as he's benevolent and also sufficiently strong. But that without him 
it wouldn't be it wouldn't be universally good. Right. And we, and what's interesting about the Squadron Supreme's plan is you remove the Squadron Supreme, it's it's not a sustainable plan. It only exists their utopia only exists when they're in control. Right. And they're that's sort of their particular weakness is that they can't imagine a world without themselves. And they really should because they keep dying so much and they keep being mind controlled so much. So they should really at the forefront of their mind go, okay, so this plan relies on Tom Thumb, the guy that we bully, being willing to, I don't know, invent brand new technology. Maybe we need a backup engineer. I don't know. (laughs) What's going to happen if these sleep chambers all not function? Yeah, those, those, hyperbonical chambers are are nuts man those are nuts those things are crazy they whip them you can bring people back to life so the squadron supreme has figured out how a way to stop death well they they, uh, they, they, they would cure all disease and instead they said we will just put you in suspended animation and eventually eventually solve all disease right but it's interesting because right to death protesters come out, which is is so is such an interesting uh, contrast to like the uh, which is so in- such an interesting contrast to death panels or right to lifers. You know, here are people who are like, no, I want the right to die. Uh, I, I I love yeah. that. I love that that sort of that political play. You know. So, so, so what do you think? So, um, I like to talk about tone a lot on this show, and like when I was reading it, the the what struck me is something I didn't like at first, but what I actually grew to think is genius is the fact that this book is written in 1985, and it's right on the teeter of modern day comics and how modern day comics are handled. But this book is very much written like a silver age book. In a lot of ways, and what 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 was getting at me at first is just like all these horrific things are happening, but they're not played as horrific. And like right. and like you know it like it, like Amanda said, everything is handled matter of factly. Like you know like Nuke dies, nobody seems to really care that much. You know you know Lady Lark gets brainwashed. Nobody like all these terrible things happen. And, like, nobody deals with the consequences of, of these things. Nobody seems to dwell on it. And I thought that was odd because, of course, if this book was written today, a lot of, the, a, a lot of, these, a lot of this stuff would be more overt. What, right. I, what I find is what, what was so genius, what Greenwald did was he didn't take a side. Like, he just lets you decide how much you should care. And, right. in a way... The callous attitude is not because of the writing, it's because the squadron, whether they know or not, are so powerful, are so above everything, that they're callous to these things. They they don't even see how horrific the things they are doing. So so it colors right. the book in that way. Because like I said, nothing is handled with the gravitas it deserves. But that's on right. but that's completely on purpose. It's not handled to the gravitas to it deserves until the very final issue when everything just goes bad. Right. And I think that there are two exceptions to that. I think the, uh, and they're both by, I think there's two exceptions to that. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, I think that there's a very cavalier attitude towards the, the impact that their actions have on other people. I a hundred percent agree. The two, two, the two things that are, I think, most prescient are, one, um, their scientist advisor, their analog to the atom, dies of brain cancer. And and his story, and it doesn't, it, it's, it's very interesting. Like, he's, nobody, he's always picked on. Nobody really listens to him. He stays around in his lab by himself. Um you know, he's not really present with much of the other members of the team. Like his his death isn't really given a lot of weight, but he is constantly worried about like morality. 
Right. Like, so th- there's this one guy who's like super moral about um, his actions and the actions that that other people have, and and really he really tries, and he's like the only real emotional core of this book. So when Nuke, their firestorm like character, it, it recognizes that his Nuke's powers are giving his parents cancer, he's like, you know. Tom Thumb, can you help me? And he's like, yeah, I guess so too. But here's the, and he doesn't tell anybody else, but he's like, I'm dying of cancer too. And I didn't want to, I didn't feel like I had anyone to tell. You're like, oh my God. So the moment you hear that, I think in issue two, there's a ticking clock knowing that Tom Thumb's going to die at any point. Right? Right. And then, and so that, that I think is, does have emotional weight in the way that all these other grander things don't like, characters dying characters being brainwashed somebody might say something about it but uh somebody might say something about it but it it doesn't have that same emotional weight and then when nuke is accidentally killed by dr spectrum Mm. i think has the most full emotional arc of of all the characters um because he goes from like the super cocky like hal jordan type womanizing sexist to being a little bit more thoughtful and and cowardly he's like i don't want to i don't want any combat actions i don't want to kill somebody else anymore and then at the very end um you know he he gets uh his power crystal gets shot and he gets sharded like shard i don't (laughs) shard but but the shards of his, his crystal go into his skin and he his skin literally becomes white the color of cowards um, the color of surrender, and I thought, oh my god, like that's that's so in- interesting thematically, like about this character. So I think I agree with you. I think that there is such a they have such a cavalier attitude towards how they deal with um, the death of other members. They just like that character's dead. Let's go. Let's move on. Lady Lark's mind controlled to fall in love with Gold Archer. Okay, well. Uh, I think uh, Arcana is like the only person who says uh, no. That's a bad idea. Um, oh, and Bluey. Oh, and and the Amphibian also was against a lot of this, and he just pieced out. I kept waiting for him to come back at the end. <laughs> yeah, he just quit, which is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. which you you know what it is for another thing about this book. I wonder, like honestly, how much did DC curve? For like their mark, because like this is happening during the same time as Crisis as, as Crisis of Infinite Earth, Barnes like, like like so like the full reboot of DC hasn't quite happened yet, and I feel like a right. lot a lot of the stuff in this book, DC might have curved from them a little bit, like you know before um before Crisis, Batman and Superman were just friends, they were just chums. It's not until it's not until post Crisis that you get, like, the antagonistic relationship between those two. And I wonder, did they get this from this? Same thing with... Yeah, well, with, go, with go ahead, the go ahead. power prints... Oh, go ahead, keep going. I'll, no, uh, go no ahead. I like Wizard. Like, you know, the fact that he needs, like, food and rest. I know something they incorporate into the Flash later. Um, yes, that was that is one of the big points. It's like, I have to eat because I have this hyper-metabolism. So there, right. there, there's a lot in here that I feel like DC might have took in subtle ways. I mean, it could be a coincidence, but I, I kind of think that it's not. Well, it's just like Power Princess and Hyperion getting together. It's literally Superman and Wonder Woman's relationship. Right. You know, because they Superman and Wonder Woman kiss after Crisis. Right? And then, and then in the New 52, they're paired together. Right. I mean, and then eventually Superman goes out with Lois Lane, whatever. But still, like that was a thing. That was a relationship that these characters had. Um, and and I think that that that's, I I think you're absolutely right. Is that there's a um, this becomes the model that I think a lot of people um, use as. I mean, these characters do not like each other. They are on a team together, but there is there is definite like objection to. Uh, some of their ide- ideologies, and even the the brain wipe mind control mod machine. I mean, some of those I- ideas 
concepts and principles are later used and implemented in identity crisis. Yes, the, yes, I, I was going to story. bring that up. Wow, yes. So, this book is influential in ways that I like. I, I'm I'm all, I'm almost sad that I'm just now reading it. Like it's really Watchmen and Kingdom Come before Watchmen and Kingdom Come, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, yeah. And who knew? <laughs> who knew besides David? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what were, um, so what, so uh, it's two questions. Who is, who is your favorite character? Like who, who was your favorite character when you were reading the book and you were like, I like this character consistently throughout. Um, and then who was the character that you thought you liked that took a turn or you're like, I don't like this character at all. Uh, I really like power princess. Like I'm, I, I really have an affinity for her. Because out of all the morally great right. people, like besides Tom Thumb, of course, I think she's the one that's ha that seems to have the most principle. Like you know, in in a lot of ways, I like you. She doesn't strike me as cavalier as the rest. She strikes me as somebody that maybe is a little bit naive, while the other one strikes me as a bit more sinister. And that just could be like you know, I like her. As far as characters that I thought I would like that I end up disliking. I don't know. I I think Nighthawk in in a lot of ways. I and I know it's weird because technically he's on the right side, but like I don't. I, I feel like what he does at the end is almost too far. And honestly, it is too far. So many people die. <laughs> <laughs> like, like so many people die. Like, 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 like you know, like I feel like there was better ways to do this than to like you know use super villains. Then like kind of when shit gets out of hand, he's kind of like, oh, I didn't expect shit to get out of hand. Like, yeah, what you thought was gonna happen? <laughs> That's that was so great, Master Menace. You Master Menace, they're like Lex Luthor analog. It's like um, he's like, you know, this is gonna be a fight. And Nighthawk's like. No, it's not going to be a fight. <laughs> and Master Menace is like, oh, well, well, uh, I'll be there to pick up the pieces when everything is done. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's basically like that exact same thing. That sort of like uh, um, that sort of brilliancy, uh, the brilliant aspect of it that I, I I really love. What about you, Amanda? Was there a character you really came to, to love in the series and, and when you uh, maybe started to like that you didn't like so much? I would just have to say that in general, most of the most of the less known characters, in particular, a lot of the villains. Firefox is great, by the way. Just, I just want. They, to yeah, most of them. The first time they're introduced, you're like, "This is so stupid. <laughs> this is dumb." Like the name, the, the like everything, and then by the you know by the end of the series, I'm like. Uh, no, like, every single one of those, like, throwaway side villain characters was really cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, Foxfire like, was fantastic. I thought she yeah. was great. Um, even, like, The Shape. Um, oh, or, the shape. or, like, the, you know, tyrant from 40 centuries in the future or something, right? Like, that's... Uh, uh, Scarlet Centurion. Yeah. yeah, which is got, which is a the version of Cain the Conqueror, Amanda. I don't know if you knew that. Okay. <laughs> well, I just love the idea of this guy sitting in the future with like all of this power and all of this technology, and he's like popping in to be like, maybe I'll conquer the past now. And then he checks back like a week later, and he's like, "Are you guys ready yet?" It's like, dude, you should know. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, like, um. It just seems so absurd, and then at some point, I'm like, no, I'm totally, I'm with it. I'm with it. Like, I got over myself for all of the absurdity. Uh, um, it, it, what's funny about the Red Satyrian is, like, um, Hyperion totally pulls his bitch card and just scares <laughs> him half to death. <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, Hyperion's supposed to be an, like, like a Superman analog. That was a very un-Superman thing like to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's just like that moment, though, where, you know, Superman's fighting and he goes, I've been pulling my punches this whole time. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, one of the things for me, I think the character that I 
characters I, I think that I like the most are I really like Arcana. Yes. Um, and I like, uh, even though you don't see it, what's interesting about Arcana and her like evil analog in the Redeemer's Moon Glow is both of these women use illusions to create the idea that they uh, they are the perfect superhero. Yes. Like, it's so interesting because the squadron is, is all of these people, but they, uh, they anybody who looks a little bit different, like Tom Thumb or the shape or whatever, they're always pushed to the side. So Arcana and Moonglow both use illusions to make themselves look super heroic. And that, to me, is, is very fascinating. The, the level of aristocracy or... or um, Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. The moment you where know, they were concerned about these guys can't join us because they dress like punks. You have <laughs> right. to look like an all-American superhero to be part of the the squadron, squadron. supreme. I, I was just right. waiting for what? one of them to be racist. I, I was just waiting for one of them to be racist. Thank. <laughs> uh, I got dibs on on the wizard being racist because we've already seen that he is a coward and like just seems like super elitist so that's my that's my prediction i think think blue eagle is racist (laughs) ah okay (laughs) there can be two i think i think that i think blue eagle uh i think blue eagle is like casually racist not really racist but like sort of casually racist Mm -hmm. and like uh in a way like sort of like in that justice society um Justice Society, Justice League cartoon. Oh, you, you, where, you, you're a credit to your people, son. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I think that that's sort of like, I think that that's Blue Eagle. I think that that's probably like how he's racist. Like sort of thoughtlessly racist. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like not consciously racist. I think that like Doc Spectrum and Wizard are also sort of on that like, that level of like I don't know I thought Doc Spectrum would be overtly racist if, if this was a different book <laughs> he seemed yeah. like he would be the most overtly racist <laughs> yeah that's that's what I mean like yeah because they definitely have that that's definitely how they're like um, and then I yeah but it's it's interesting to see all of these characters sort of come into play and and be so interesting I mean I think um I think all of them are, are so unique. I one of the things that is super interesting to me, um, and that is only alluded to, is the um, is the pre the team that existed before the Squadron Supreme, the Golden Agency, which was Power Princess Blue Eagle's dad. And their version of Dr. Fate, Professor Imam. Um, I thought that that was so interesting because you only hear about them very briefly. Um, but I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, there exists another team. There was a, a version of the Justice Society in this book. And I thought, wow, that's that's so interesting. Um, okay. I feel – yeah, I, I feel like there's so much we could talk about this. I wanted to um... – Make sure that before we ran out of time, we could talk a little bit about the crossover. And do we have oh, to? Yeah. I mean, I'm well, sorry, no, I'm no. Sorry. I mean, I mean, just just <laughs> the notion in general that you're reading along, and this is pretty clearly a standalone story, which is an analog for a DC story, and you're right. reading and you're reading, and then suddenly just. Captain America is in the background of a panel that's actually a flashback to something. And then suddenly you start getting these little tidbits of, well, there's like a version of, you know, like all of these characters have interacted with the Marvel universe and they have touched it. And I feel like at that point, I started thinking about the book a little bit differently I started thinking about, like, well, what would Captain America do in this book? Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, you you guys are, are both a little more steeped in comics lore. Were you guys even surprised when when this connection started showing up? When, 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 so for me, 
me, um, I, I'm willing to bet that the crossover was one of two things, and I don't have knowledge of this, but there's that weird Captain America issue, like, right in the middle. <laughs> um, I, I, For me, um, I think that either um, it was an opportunity to bring Captain, let people let readers to cap mark Grunewald was writing captain america at this time mm. and he was writing squadron supreme and i think it was an opportunity to pull readers from mm. captain america to squadron supreme because remember the the comic book market and the direct industry weren't as interconnected as they were now and we're talking 1985 right so you didn't have the internet you didn't have all of these aspects of comic culture and the comic industry to let you know that, oh, by the way, the guy who's writing Captain America is also writing this book, The Squadron Supreme, and you should check it out. I do feel like the crossover takes away from the book a little bit, the, I agree. reading the trade. Um, mm-hmm. but, but, but at the same time, I recognize... Um, one, you get to see Nighthawk, which is cool. You, so you do get sort of that interlude of like what Nighthawk was doing between when you see him again in issue nine, I think it's issue eight and nine, where he like jumps in with the Redeemers and you're like, oh, yeah. that's where Nighthawk was. Um, I don't think you need that issue. Um, but I understand why it's, oh, I understand why the, they did the crossover. Uh, I don't think it's essential at all. Uh, into reading and enjoying the book. Um, so it sort of deflates. I like that they included it in the collection, but it's it's literally the, the least good piece of that collection. One more thing I want to touch on before we wrap up is the conversation Nighthawk and Hyperion has, right? At um, the end or at the beginning? No, at the end, at the end. Um, it's weird, because, like, you know, you read this book, you are against the squadron, right? Even though you spend time with them, you don't see what happens to the people. Again, I think that's very purposeful. But when Nighthawk says, you know, especially, like, you know, I try not to put things in modern context. I try to put it within the realm that it was that it was in. But I think even back then, this was a problem. When Nighthawk said, okay, we're going we're gonna to dismantle everything you did, and we're going to reinstate prisons, and we're going to give back guns to everybody. And I'm kind of like, <laughs> uh, yay! <laughs> like, you know, I, I spent 12 issues rooting against these people. Then when Nighthawk says it out loud, I'm kind of like, hmm, I don't know. Like, like y- yeah, I guess, but hmm. <laughs> Knowing what I know. <laughs> well, I'm also, I, go ahead. Amanda. I was gonna say I'm also trying to imagine like the practical process of like, are they just gonna stand out in front of a warehouse and just like hand out guns for free, <laughs> or like, are they just gonna, you know, these these job centers that they opened up, are they just gonna like close them? I I don't. I'm trying to picture the practical <laughs> ramifications of undoing these things. Um, all the people who were already put into those hypersleep pods, are we just pulling the plugs? Yeah. <laughs> because, like, you know, because, like, I agree. Like, I agree with him. Humans have to earn it. They have to make their own mistakes. But when you say it out loud, especially in today's age, what we know about, you know, the, 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 the prison system, what we know about gun laws and everything else, it's just kind of like, uh, maybe there's a happy medium between the two? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, but it's also, in a way, it's like his, keep in mind, he's a politician, right? Right. So there's two things I really love about that speech. It's one, it's totally the politician in him coming out. Like, it's totally like him being like, we're going to give back guns to people, and we're going to bring back prisons, and vote for Kyle Richmond in 2020. (laughs) So in one way, it's totally like him leaning on that political rallying. But what's so interesting um, about, about that piece is that Hyperion, Hyper, this is the only time Hyperion and Nighthawk are, are friends at that end. You know, he's like, here you're going, like Hyperion's, Hyperion's getting his ass kicked by um, Redstone, who's like the, their version of Apache Chief from the Super Friends. He's just like beating the crap out of Hyperion. Oh, well, I didn't even make that and, connection. Go, go, go ahead. Yeah, totally beating the crap out of uh, 
Apache Chief is 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 like basically like pummeling the crap out of um, just totally pummeling crap out of Hyperion, and Hyperion loses his glasses. And the Night Hawk picks up the glasses and says, "Here you are, old friend." And you get this beautiful Paul Ryan, Mark Grunewald interconnection between the images and the art, where uh, he was he was blind. Hyperion was blind, but now he sees the the damage that it's very Greek mythology. You know, mm-hmm. it's very like Oedipus Rex kind of connection, which is great because Hyperion comes from that Greek mythology. So it's a very powerful literary connection, you know, a, a very nice allegory in terms of like making that connection um, that I think ultimately is what changes the tenor of, of the miniseries. It's, it's what lets Hyperion see the error of his ways. Um, you've, re- you've reminded me of one more thing that we definitely have to bring up, um, which is the art. Oh, yeah. Um, the layouts in this were great. I found yeah. there were a few really clever things. My favorite was, um, when, uh, Lady Lark is trying to break up with Golden Archer and the words actually literally separate them on the page. And it doesn't even matter what she's saying. You can just say, you can just visualize the words pushing them apart from each other. Yeah. Um, and just some things like that, because this was a very wordy book and there was a lot of sitting around desks and <laughs> a lot of just like shot reverse shot style individual panels. And somehow it was still um, overall, the layouts ended up being really interesting. Um they did a. This was really, really amazingly well done. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, comparing it to something like the Dark Phoenix Saga, where I know a lot of people love the Dark Phoenix Saga, and they have a lot of connection to the X Men, and the Dark Phoenix Saga in a lot of ways is is like the foundational root for people's love of comics. But if you're talking about, there's so much backstory you need. I, I think in order to get Dark Phoenix Saga, there's mm-hmm. 130 some odd issues of X-Men that you have to read before you read Dark Phoenix Saga. I mean, we, we just read it and we just jumped right in and we, we thought we did okay, but um, it's definitely not as accessible as this was. No, no, yeah. not at all. We, I, like, yeah. I was leaning heavily on the cartoon to understand what was going on in the Claremont book. <laughs> right. And so I, I think that, that that to me is what's really interesting is the art direction here. Even though you have several different artists, they all is all consistent. Just, yeah, it's all consistent. And what's interesting, too, uh, I had mentioned this before, um, is that like. There's some really interesting um, analogs to, like, there's um, the s- issue seven and eight where there where there's two Hyperions at once, um, yeah. which I thought was really interesting. It is where there's, like, the Hyperions battling each, each other. Um, I thought that was really interesting because that is a, a riff on at least the, the, initial, the initial part of that story where like Hyperion has to punch an asteroid out of the sky. That is literally a uh, Superman radio show uh, plot point that they literally took this Silver Age idea and then spun it into something totally different. Yeah. So so it's interesting to see Mark Grunewald play with these Silver Age ideas but tell a totally different story. I was also, also like to give a shout out to all the covers. All, all the covers are great, in my opinion. Every single one of them. I, and you know what's interesting is the splash pages. So every splash page is a, a, a giant. Every first issue of every page is this giant splash page featuring a hero, whether it's Nighthawk swooping down or um, Power Princess deflecting the bullets from those gun nuts or uh, Wizard racing through the city. Like each one of those, I mean, the covers are gorgeous. I love them all. But if you look at the um, the visuals of just leading with a main character on that first page, I think it's so powerful. Um, yeah, I 
I mean, I feel like we could talk about this book literally forever. Um, uh, are there any? I look forward to reading it again in the future. Um, uh, I'm, uh, gonna, yeah. you know, I'm gonna be like throwing this out at more people, and yeah. You know, Amanda, you brought up the wizard, and like we brought up like one of the major pieces. Of, we actually forgot to talk about one of the major pieces of hypocrisies in this book is they want to take away guns, but as soon as all, all the shit go bad, the first thing wizard goes do is go get a gun and go out like. Rambo well, that was why. I, yeah, that was why he was my pick as like spineless coward racist. Was that he like wants to run away from fights, and he, you know, he, yeah, he was he was my pick for hypocrite. Uh, <laughs> in the, you know, the the annual Amanda Comey hypocrisy and comic book character award first first. Uh, champion is the wizard from squadron supreme 1985 <laughs> see you guys see you guys next year for uh next year's uh ceremony well every year well, you know batman will win every year if we're being honest but yeah go ahead and say. <laughs> um but yeah i mean is there anything else you want to share while we've got you here um and where that- can people buy your books where can people find you online david Oh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at David Gallagher. Uh, my books are available, The Own Living Boy Omnibus and The Own Living Girl, uh, Volume 1, are available at Barnes & Noble in the East Coast. They're available on Amazon, Target, Walmart, your favorite local bookstores, uh, favorite comic book shops. Um, and then, uh, yeah, find me on Facebook and find me on uh, Twitter at David Gallagher. And Amanda, where could everybody reach us if they want to talk about the Squadron Supreme? Um, so we are Comic Book Club 52 on Twitter. 52 like the number of weeks in the year or like the new 52. You can also email us, comicbookclub52 at gmail.com. And we're also on Facebook as the Comic Book Club. Clearly the, uh, the Comic Book Club, which is currently obsessed with uh, – 1980 1980s marvel books so uh oh you my look god up you are absolutely stuff right and our squadron supreme stuff and have a little nostalgia trip so and as far as you know speaking um this if you bought the collected edition of, of of this comic it it has a gorgeous cover by alice ross which brings me into december for this show which is i i have now declared alice ross month so we'll be looking at four Alex Ross books. Usually there will be three episodes, but since it's Christmas, we're giving you a present of four episodes. And those books are Kingdom Come, Marvels, Astro City, and Justice League World Greatest Superheroes by Alex Ross and Paul Dini. That's what we will be discussing for the whole month of December. And this is Alex Ross stuff, so I'm going to probably go out and try to find physical copies of most of these books. Right. You so I'm glad you. I'm glad you gave me notice. Or, uh, consider what Superman. I, have you guys? Have you guys read the Superman Hope book? Um, that's actually in the Justice League World Greatest Superhero one. Like it's all of those. It's all of those uh, single um, stories that they did together. Those Treasury editions. Yes. Yeah. So it's all of them together. It, it's oh, Superman, gotcha. okay. Hope, cool. Shazam, like that. yeah. So it, it just came out, and like I need an excuse to read it. So this is, <laughs> this is the perfect excuse to read it right here. Yeah, that's this is really as cool. much an accountability group as it is a book club. I mean, that, that's really how this show started. It just because I, I was so backed up. You know, David, I actually wanted to talk to you about that. Like, you know, you 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 spearheaded digital comics in a lot of ways. I just want to say I am a fully digital comics buyer. I have like nearly fifteen hundred comics trades all through Comicsology. And like, wow. and like, you know, I think maybe I'll probably owe you a little bit of thanks for that since you kind of like was an early adopter of the format. Well, thank you. I will, I will take that. <laughs> I will take that credit. But yeah, we, uh, I've loved working digitally. I think for me, um, working digitally, what's great about it is that it becomes a platform um, where you can reach almost everybody. Um, you know, so it's sort of like this really great one-stop shop where you can find almost anything you want. It's a digital comic shop in your pocket, um, which is what makes doing web comics and, and digital comics. I know they're a little different, but it's still that, that same 
idea is that you have access to if you have access to your phone or your iPad or your computer, you can literally just hop on and start reading comics. And that to me is that to me is amazing. You know, being able to, to have comics wherever you go is, is pretty spectacular without having to bring out your long box and be like, well, let me find Avengers 75. <laughs> let me find New Warriors number one. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty spectacular thing. Okay, so, David, thank you for coming on. We really do appreciate it from the bottom of our heart. And, you know, anytime you ever want to come on again, you are more than welcome. If there's any book you want to talk about, if you want to give suggestions, we are more than happy to take it. And, like I said, thank you for coming. Great. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, it, are we done? Are, is that yeah, it? I'm done. All I'm right. done. So, for <laughs> Amanda Comey, I am Jamil Payne. And we are out.